We are at Game Lab 2015 talking about a really serious and sad topic, which is how video games will destroy humanity. What can you tell us about that? Well, uh, <laughs> I'll try and distill the 45 minute talk into a one minute explanation. Um, Basically, what I'm suggesting in the talk is that as we move forward into a more digital and virtual economy, um, as consumerism becomes unchecked by the availability of raw resources, uh, once we have a digital monopoly when Apple or Google or Valve wins the digital distribution wars, we will then have no natural check on humanity's drive to consume and to define itself by entertainment product instead of by making changes to the world. Wow. How, how can we save that? By making better games. Um, I believe that um, in the future, 50 years, 100 years from now, everyone's going to be a games developer of some kind. They're going to be a programmer. They're going to be working on artificial intelligence or art or writing or music. And we today, as the sort of precursors to those people in the future, we need to start setting down reasonable approaches because the people who make video games I always say to my friends they're some of the most liberal wonderful modern people that you'll ever meet um, so why is it that the stuff we turn out is often so illiberal um, I think we can do better does that imply making games which uh, make you reflect or think about what you're doing think about yourself question yourself like the Talos principle Yes, I would say it involves that. However, I would be careful to say that it's, I'm not trying to suggest that every game must be uh, discursive in this manner. Um, there is a room for, there's room for fun games, there's room for uh, purely emotional games, there's room for abstract aesthetic games. Um, but for me, I think the opportunity that we're really missing out on, especially from a narrative perspective, is yeah, to have that political, philosophical, moral conversation with the player um, to make video games about more than Twitch reaction. Mm -hmm. Which is the main feedback you've got from this storytelling uh, used on the Talos principle in that regard? What was the feedback? From players that have questioned themselves and that have reflected after playing the Talos principle. What's the main feedback they're giving you? So uh, the main feedback, the good feedback is, um, wow, that made me feel intelligent and made me think about things which I cared about but which I hadn't thought about before. Um, that's the good feedback. The bad feedback is like, wow, you made me have an argument with a computer and then you didn't give me enough options to win the argument. Um, that's the bad feedback. Uh, for further depth in, in uh, uh, narrative and storytelling, uh, what do you think is the main um, uh, advice you're giving other uh, developers? Or what can we try to do? And of course, you've shared the space with people from Bioware and Witcher and Chris Crawford. And I don't know if there's been a, a, a chat about it. So. Um I would say, I mean, first, as, as regards advice and such like that, I always say, um, you know, I'm British, right? So I don't like to be complimented. I like to be criticized. That's how we communicate. And um, so I always like to say that I, I'm, not, I'm not any good, really, as a writer. I'm not a naturally skilled writer. I've always thought of myself as a jack of all trades, right? I was lucky in life. I got a good education. Um, I didn't come from a poor background. I got to do what I wanted to do. I'm lucky, but I'm not that good, right? So the way that I try to introduce quality and innovation to my games and what I recommend to other people is don't worry about trying to do the best writing in the world. Just set your target in the right place in the first place because all the brilliant writing in the world isn't going to turn your shooting men in the face game into anything other than a shooting men in the face game, even if you do attach a whole bunch of political commentary to it, which is nice, it's a good effort, but it's not going to cut it. So aim for the right place in the first place, aim to do something that's different. Um, on the matter of talking to the other writers here, um, the only person that I spent significant time with, it's not even significant, but I chatted to um, Chris Crawford, 
Um, and uh, I would have to say he is certainly one of the more um, rational, logical, um, and generally correct people <laughs> that I've met in this line of work. What about the depth? Uh, which is the next step uh, for uh, deeper storytelling? Depth. What is depth? I don't know what depth is. Um, so... Maybe depth is something that makes you think of what you're played for longer time. I think that there's a lot we can do with the existing mechanics that are out there for us. We spend a lot of time trying to come up with new mechanics. Chris Crawford's been doing that for 22 years, as, as he keeps, keeps saying. Um, but when you look at games like Papers, Please, it's not using any systems that we couldn't have done 20 years ago. You know, it's just a matter of becoming confident with those systems, confident enough to apply them in a way that an audience, which has also grown up in the last 20 years, can read into it and read more into it than is just there on the screen. It's, a lot of it is about familiarity. You see the same thing in, in cinema. Uh, in you know, the opening years of cinema, a lot of those films were <laughs> kind of quite bad by today's standards because they hadn't established the tropes and the shorthand and the little skills that allowed them to layer up the depth in a movie. Um, and until you kind of have full control over what you're producing, it's hard to get that depth. What goes into the writing of a game like Faster Than Light? So Faster Than Light was very much a, a writing job rather than a narrative design job for me. I distinguish narrative design is heavily involved with the team, involved in game design stuff. It's really taking over some part of the role from the creative director. You know, because you need to be responsible for not just your words, but how they get implemented. Um, <clears throat> on FTL, I was just writing. So I played there on live demo and loved it and emailed them saying, guys, let me, let me help you. And they said, great, we were just thinking we've got all this money and we don't know what to spend it on. Maybe we need a writer. And so I came on and um, initially I tried to... Um, I wanted to take it in a more fleshed out direction for the narrative. I wanted to have a codex describing the world. I wanted to have multi-part quests which could only be completed over various playthroughs. I wanted alternate endings and all of this. And it would have been doable um, insofar as FTL is very text driven. So it's not too expensive to add those things. But the guys sat me down and they said, look, that is not the game we're making. We're making an arcade game. It's about fighting people in space. The story is there to flavor it. Um, so writing for FTL was really just a case of finding as efficient ways as possible to express quite a lot to players. Um, when you arrive in a new star system, you don't want to read more than one or two lines of text. But you do want to get a sense that you're somewhere interesting. So it's really going back to classic kind of George Orwell uh, writing rules, which is keep it simple, never use long words when you can use a short one, don't use jargon. I did use a bit of jargon because it's a sci-fi game, what are you going to do? But generally, keep your use of text efficient. What about your experience with a game like Penumbra? And Shinji Mikami uh, told us yesterday that he thought that the horror genre was really, really struggling. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Well, you know, it's funny. <laughs> a lot of the games that I work on, that I love, are not games I would play as a player, um, including The Swapper, including Talos. They're too abstract puzzles for me. I can't, my brain doesn't like those sorts of puzzles. Um, and also, I don't play a lot of survival horror games. Um, I suppose I would broadly agree because you can see how it's a genre which easily falls into stagnation. I mean, I think you could probably fairly accuse cinema of being in exactly the same place as far as horror goes, right? It's, it's only so many times you can jump out of a closet at someone before you need to find a really new way to jump out of a closet. Um, but Maybe storytelling can save that? Maybe. Um, I think that, I mean, I lo the funny thing is I love horror cinema much more than I love horror games. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that horror cinema, what's great about it is that it takes real world people, real characters that we recognize that we might meet in day-to-day -day life, and then it puts them under incredible pressure 
and it sees what comes out. And some of those characters will become heroes, others will become villains, right? Depending on how the pressure plays on them. And for me, that's basically a science experiment. That's the same as being in, in chemistry class and being given a, a chemical substance and applying heat to it to see what it does. The more extreme a situation you put a substance in, the more you learn about it. So that's why horror is great for me. It puts the human psyche under incredible pressure and it sees where it breaks and that's the interesting stuff. So if you're talking about storytelling in horror games I would have to say they've got to stop focus on trying to do jump scares and atmospheric stuff and maybe start bringing character back in in a much heavier way. It might provide a new way to get a, a different kind of scare. Closing one, what can we expect from you now uh, which makes us reflect again? Uh, you, you mean what am I working on next? Um, so I'm actually I'm negotiating on a couple of things right now. There's emails sitting in my inbox waiting, waiting for a reply. So um, I'm hoping that I'll have a couple of new things to announce uh, very shortly in terms of freelance work. Um, and every time I take a freelance job, I am delaying finishing my own games, right? So um, I have um, Irrational Investigator, which I need to finish at some point, um, philosophical logic game. Um, and I also want to make the game that I talked about in the talk today. I want to make a brave new world, a future world where everyone is hooked into the system and no one even thinks to rebel. No one cares to rebel. It's not that the rebellion is suppressed, it's that there are no rebels left. Um, that's the sort of game I would like to do. I've got the world ready, I just need to find the game to explore it. Thank you, Tom, for your time. Let's save humanity. <laughs> Please do.